So that 24 hours to write, learn C++, you've got to be having a laugh. Um, but actually, um, the idea here, I, I spent back to back about 24 hours writing a compiler for a language called Small Basic. And how that came about was I was teaching my kids to program and uh, I was using Small Basic and it has, um, it has procedures but it doesn't have functions. So I'm like, we, wanted, we had the house and I wanted to have a function for the house where we could put different sizes of houses but we had to set a global variable and I was like, I'm not having this. <laughs> So I was like, oh, God, this is just awful. So we moved immediately to F-sharp. But after, I just had this, uh, and we, we just did it in F-sharp, and that was fine. I mean, it was f five or six at the time, so that was f perfectly okay. But uh, it was still sort of nagging there. Why can't we just have that language with functions? And then I wouldn't have had to go, you know, do this massive trip early on. Um, so around Christmas last year, I wrote Small Basic, and I added functions. Um, and then also while I was there, I was like, well, what I really need here is um, pattern matching and tuples. Um, so I've added that as well. And I, I thought it was kind of funny because C Sharp and VB and Java don't have it. Um, but I put it in in a couple of hours, and we'll have a look at that later. And it works really well, actually, in BASIC. Um, so I had a lot of fun with that. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to have a few little slides. I'm going to introduce some BASIC um, stuff about languages. And then we're going to dive in, and I'm going to show you the code. What I'm going to do is not jump you straight into uh, the full small basic. We're going to do a smaller language, and then I'm going to drop, drop you right in it. So this talk is not about how to write compilers the hard way. So uh, anybody here do C Sharp? Cool. So um, the C Sharp team have learned how to do it the hard way and um, spent seven years writing a compiler. Um, I will show you my version that I did on train. Um, it's not all theory, and it's we are gonna we're gonna be writing compilers. This is not website stuff. It's, it's gonna be a little bit harsh. Okay, so this talk is about turtles. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, you're gonna hear this the term abstract syntax tree all the time. That's all I ever talk about. And, uh, but I'll explain that in a bit. We're going to do parsing, so we're going to take text in files and convert that into abstract syntax trees. We're going to talk a little bit about domain-specific languages. Um, now, typically, we have a compiler. You know, we, we compile out with our C-sharp and Java to machine code or IL code. Uh, but we're also going to look at interpreters, because that's also very valid. So, um, my limited... Um, experience with programming languages and uh, if we go back to the 60s there's a lot more than these but this is pretty much what what the scene looks like now the mainstream so um, little seven languages in seven weeks there good book um, so lisps still just holding on since the 60s there's closure around um, ml um, i'm going to be showing f sharp code and that's one part of the ml family as is haskell ocaml whole bunch of languages and lots of languages are influenced, like Swift is influenced by ML. We're going to be writing a basic. They're still around, um, surprisingly. And most things seem to have converged on a C-like syntax. Um, I was reading an interesting um, paper a little while ago that they took um, absolute beginners to programming and they used, gave them a C syntax and a purely randomly generated syntax. And there was absolutely no difference in productivity for beginners <laughs> between the random syntax and the C syntax. I think the, the great, you know, the thing about the C syntax is that people have been, they get used to it. So if you're an existing programmer, you, you've learned all these random, random things, then you're okay. But if you haven't, there's, you know, it's not actually that sensical. Okay, so th those are your families. So if you're going to write a language, you're probably going to pick one of those these days if you want to be a hipster, cool person. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on language because nobody does these days. On language design, it's, I think, considered optional. Um, we've got three different approaches we can take. Uh, we can go ad hoc. Um, so we can start with a personal homepage. 
uh, PHP and then we can add bits to it over many years and just turn into this huge Malgus mess. Um, we can do JavaScript, spend a couple of weeks um, putting a C syntax on Scheme um, and then have, that, have the whole world using either JavaScript or PHP. Another ad hoc approach is to not sort of go for a particularly defined route, just put everything in the language and that's Scala. So um, th those, that's your ad hoc approach. A very common approach at the moment is copy and delete. So you take an existing language, copy it and remove functionality from it. So that's Java, it's taken some of C++, remove pointers, remove multiple inheritance. And I think there's, there's a lot of value in that and kept the same weird syntax. Um, J is um, taking APL. Anybody here done APL? A, a programming language, very original name. Um, that has um, no keywords. Everything's Greek symbols. So what J did was remove those Greek symbols because they're a bit weird. Um, Go went a little bit further than Java. Took C++, or, or in effect Java, and removed classes, which may be a good idea. Replaced those with structs, um, removed generics, uh, removed inheritance, all, you know, all that kind of thing. And that's been really popular at the moment. So um, uh, you've got structs and you've got mixins. Okay. So you can do a fair amount. And then they've done a nice thing, like they actually thought about concurrency, which this one didn't. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of good. And then you've got, um, so that, that's your, I think that's actually a pretty good route to take an existing language because you people are familiar with it and remove stuff that hurts. And obviously pointers and things hurt. Actually, another thing that Java removed was go to. So now we'll move on to copy and add. So C Sharp in the first version took Java and added go to. Uh, since then, it's added some nicer things like link and things, but that's actually kind of more around the syntactic sugar and library level. Uh, F sharps was actually back really compatible with OCaml, and it's added some bits over the top, so that's a copy and add. Um, and Haskell is a blatant copy of Miranda, and then they've added some, um, which was a language popular in the 80s in universities, and they added um, really bizarre things like monads and type classes that make people scared. Um, but people are actually still using uh, Miranda for teaching because Miranda's the nice, easy part of Haskell that doesn't put people off. Cool, so there's your, your choices um, for language style. So I, I kind of think of it as considered optional. We'll just take one of those routes. So um, everything is going to be around turtles, and I'm nearly at the code now. The... Um, the language we're going to start with is a language called Logo. I'm going to call it's going to be a, a small version, so I'm going to call it Turtle. And uh, so, how many people here have used Logo? Oh, the old ones. <laughs> so, uh, Logo was a uh, pro and is a programming language from the 70s, designed to teach children um, to code. Um, so, when I was about seven or eight, we had this Logo programming language. Um, in the school and you could either draw on the screen or you had a little turtle that would go around and draw with a pen and it was awesome and um, this few lines of code draws this and the ironic, ironic thing about um, Ogo was it was a wonderful language which we'll look at but nobody ever got to use the language because they're having too much fun drawing things on the screen which is what, what we'll start by doing um, so nobody got any further than that um, so, our language repeat 10, again, this is kind of so people understand, beginners understand repeat, they don't understand for i equals 1 to 10. So, repeat 10, this is a block, we'll turn right 36 degrees, then repeat 5, forward 54, right 72 degrees, and that draws this. So, you can get amazing patterns with just a few, few instructions. So, our challenge is to pass that string of turtle code and convert that and compile that down, right? What we'll start with doing is an interpreter. But first, we need some way of, we pass that into something before we push it to the interpreter or to the compiler. 
And that's our abstract syntax tree. Okay? So, um, this is F sharp code. So, this is the abstract syntax tree for what we just saw, these few lines of code. Now, this is why we can do it in 24 hours, because we've, we've described the abstract syntax tree in four lines of code. All right? So, this is the winning part. So if you're going to do compilers the easy way, you want to use something that has an easy way of describing trees. So we have a module. We'll define, this is a type annotation, just saying arguments are ints for now. And we say a command could either, either be, this is an or, forward of argument, turn of argument, or repeat of argument, that's the count, and the list of commands. So that's recursive. And so we, this basic building block is our starting point, and what we'll do is, as our language gets more complex, we add new features, we'll just add things here. And we'll be able to expand that all the way out to C Sharp or Java. So, to the code. Um, everyone following so far? Yes, <laughs> Abstract syntax tree, right? Do uh, let, let me know if you don't. And so so that, that wasn't some sort of weird um, description language. That's just code that runs in Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio on Linux or Mac. So here is the code, and we can just uh, hover over it. That's forward. Okay. So what I've done is I've taken the liberty of here's some code I prepared earlier. This is the interpreter. So we um, to perform Turtle's actions... We match forward, and we go forward. Turn uh, updates the turtle's angle with the number. Nice and easy. It's almost one line for one line at the moment. And then repeat just has a recursive function and repeats those, all of the commands in the repeat block. All right, that's our interpreter. So what, we get, what I'm trying to do here is go quickly. I want to, like get my interpreter up and work out whether I'm in the right direction before I spend two years going the wrong direction. So, um, I can describe, I'm actually writing out the abstract syntax tree. So this, this command here, we say, I want a list with the repeat command. I pass in 36, forward 10, turn 10. So it's very close to the language I'm trying to do. But I still, I've still got to write my parser. So, I load in the AST and the interpreter I just showed you, and I execute, and that draws the circle. All right. So repeat 36 times, go forward 10, round 10. Here's a slightly more complex one, which is what we saw before. There we go. So, but what we what we want to do is we want to be able to write it like this, um, not actually write it in that language, right? So we need to pass text into that format. That's what we're going to do now. Okay, so... So again, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to use a library that helps me pass text, right? So instead of writing it all by hand, and the library I'm using is something called a parser combinator library, which is just you combine put little parsers together to make a big parser. And that's quite nice. So I've loaded in the combinator library. I'm going to load in a test function. And I want to pass forward 10. Right? So using fparsec forward is I expect a string with the word forward. <laughs> it's too easy. Um, that's piped along with some spaces and a float. And that's my thing. So literally, I've got one line of code for my instruction. Now, if you have a C-sharp-like method, that's no, not really any different, apart from we might add brackets around it. But that's our parser. All right, so I can test that out. So I don't even have to compile and run. I just press Alt-Enter, and I'll just make that visible. And the uh, F-sharp evaluates that for me. 
and we got a test, and it's actually pulled out the number 10 here. Right? So I can see that's work. All good so far, right? Now, what I don't want to, want to happen is if I put in forward and out of space and 10, that should be an error, right? Because um, in, in uh, logo, you can have numbers inside the name. So that should fail. Let's try that out. It's still success 10. So I need to, instead of saying spaces, which could be zero or many, I need to have at least one space. So I can fix that. Space is one. <laughs> Done. That's that. Now I get an error. All right. This is what I want. So I can just very quickly test my, what, what I want in a language. Now what's really cool about using these pass combinator libraries is I've got error messaging support for free. So it's actually looks at the code, put a pointer to the bit where I was expecting white space and said I was expecting white space. So my error messaging is done. I have nothing to do. It's just too easy. Right? Okay. Now, we, we talked about the abstract syntax tree. So what I need to do is I need to take that forward parser and push it into my, my value, the forward value. Right? So that line of code does that. And we'll just test that out. So that's actually created, a, that's got success forward 10. So we're already into the abstract syntax tree for that particular method. Right. And anybody coming tomorrow will be having a go at this and you'll be able to do your own passes. So, logo programmers don't like typing forward. It's just too much effort. All right. So you have a short form, which is FD. All right. So what we want to do is we want to say, if they put the string FD or forward, then it's forward. All right. So we can do that by saying P string forward and this or operator or forward. Done. So let's try that out. Now we can use that. This or statement allows us to do all sorts of crazy things later. Okay, so we've got forward 10 there, and if I try FD10, now look how fast I can do all this. I'm literally, so that also gave me forward 10. So I'm literally just pressing a few keys, and I've got a result. So instead of, if you're using something like Lex and Yak or Java, <laughs> then you'll write like 100 lines of code, and then you go, oh no, whoops. But here we just, we just try it out immediately, get the response, and now we make these little small pieces of the language and then we combine them all together. So, let's do that. Now, um, don't do this at home. What I've done is I put the interpreter in the same file just for my own convenience. I'll just push that through. And now I'm going to show you all the code we need to do that example we wanted. So forward, for same thing we just seen, left and LT and right, LT uh, for left, RT for right, same thing, just kind of a cut and paste job. And now we're going to do the hard one. So this is where you start to, where I said it wasn't going to be that easy. We want to have a repeat block and we want commands. So a command could be forward, left, right, or p repeat. Those are the commands in our set. Right? And we've already defined forward, left, and right. We've got a problem with repeat. And the problem with repeat is a repeat could contain a repeat. Right? So how do we deal with that? So what we do is we say, we just, in effect, do some mutation. We say create a forward reference to repeat, and we'll define repeat later. Right? Because any for repeat could be anywhere. Then we can define a block as saying, <laughs> you're gonna like this, a block is between open square bracket and closed square bracket. It's just too easy. Um, many commands separated by spaces. 
20. All right. Um, now the repeat command we now can define because we've defined our block type. So we can say a repeat has a space or spaces, a number, the repeat count, small spaces. It, you might actually put the square bracket right next to the number, that's fine. It's not going to interfere. And then the block. And that's our parser for repeat. And we mash that all together and we say we'll pass some code, we'll run many commands, because we have many commands, um, over, I'll pass it for many commands over the code. If we get success back, then we'll return the result, and if we get a failure, we'll throw an exception with the message that it's done for us with a beautiful error message. All right, so that's all good. Um, so to prove the point, so let's just give a, we'll do a quick line count. Um, Less than 100 lines, and this includes the interpreter. Actually, if we look at the parser itself, it starts about here, 69 to 90. About 20 lines of code, and we've got a parser for our simple turtle language. And the line, you know, it's not very far off what the code looks like. It's almost one-to-one. -one. So that's going to pass that code block, execute in our interpreter, bang. We have passed the turtle language and executed it. Sweet. It's too easy, isn't it? Okay, so let's, let's knock it up a gear. Now, uh, the turtle language allows us to define functions, so it's better than small basic. <laughs> um, actually, I really like this. Um, to, to define a function, you just say two and the name of it. I don't think I've seen a, a terse language for that. And you can have parameters. Parameters have got colon on the front. So what we want to do now, I, I showed you some art at the start. This, this logo program is a piece of beautiful modern art. And we're going to pass that code uh, with our own parser and generate art. And that's the, the, the art bits, obviously, this is the set random position is important here. So <coughs> let's have a look at that. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the same abstract syntax tree that we had before and we've extended it a little bit. So I've added a new command set random position and I've added two new parts to the tree. One is the ability to call a function and the other ability is to define a function. So again, we've just got two new lines of code to define those two powerful concepts. Right? Now a, a call takes a name and a list of arguments. A procedure has a name a list of parameters and a list of commands inside the body. Yep. Now, although this is a Diddy language, this is not particularly different from any other programming language, and I'll we'll prove that point later on, probably after the break. So, um, I've got the same interpreter. I've extended it a little bit for the set random position and the call and procedure. Now. Just see how this scales up a little bit. What I need to do is, because I'm going to define my own um, functions, I need to be able to define identifiers. Identifiers is what we call like the function names and parameter names. So for that, in um, logo, this is from the 70s, uh, minus sign is valid inside um, the, the function name. So it could be a letter or a minus sign, but that was pretty easy. Um, and so we just say it has to satisfy, it, the start character has to be a letter or a minus sign. So the first one is the um, that. And then subsequent characters can be a letter, a digit, or the minus sign. Right? So that's our rule there. So a few lines go, that's actually a bit of work there. I actually copy and pasted that from the sample to fparsec. Let's go on a little bit. Parameters. Parameters have a colon. At the front, and then they're an identifier. Everyone's still following along? Good. Now, what we haven't explained it, these have got these are um, combinators are operators, right? These are custom operators in the library. And what we're saying with this one is we're passing, so the arrows passing that way, and the dot saying I want the thing on the right. Now what you could say is that um, the, we want the thing on the left. So we want something colon as a parameter, and then we put the dot there instead. 
Now, it's a bit weird. The great thing is, uh, what you've seen before, is we just highlight the code and press return, and we find out if it works or not. And sometimes I get it wrong, and then I just put the dot in the other place. It's, it's not that hard, because you can find out about it. You don't have to wait for the compile and then the run. So, so we've got all our normal functions, and then I've added random there. Um, we've got our repeat. And you see, I'm just making it just slightly longer here. We've got a command, could be any of those things, could be a call as well now. The blocks are the same. And here's a nice bit. For our function, um, our functions can have parameters, so we'll have many parameters separated by spaces. We'll have a header which is the two and the name, right? Uh, for, we're followed by parameters. So we say two, at least one space, identify at least one space and the parameters. So that's the first line. The body has many commands, yeah? And the footer has the word end. And I compose that together and I say a procedure has a header, a body, and a footer. And that's our parser for our procedures. And I've got one almost the same for C-sharp, but curly braces instead of begin and end. Um, so we take the name and the parameters out from this first one, and we take the body here. And then I just um, store, what, what Logo does is it's storing a set of procedures as we go. So we can only use the procedures that are already defined. So I'm just keeping a running list of procedures and I return the procedure, the, the abstract syntax tree representation of that procedure. We're almost done. There's some amazing art waiting for you after this. Um, so, basically, um, our parser, now we've just extended the parser a little bit. We could start our parser, could, could start with spaces, and then it's separated. Uh, we have uh, commands or procedures, right? <coughs> That's, that's our logo, how the logo parser works. So, there's that code I just showed you. I'll just press this. So that has passed that code and produced this wonderful picture. Yeah, and every new, every one is different because it's random. So that's pretty cool. So we are ramping it up a little bit. I'm going to ramp it up a little bit more later, but what we want to do next, so we've done our parser, we've done a very simple parser, and I'll show you some more, more uh, complex ones, but we've already done a lot of a language, and for a business rules engine or something like that, that's probably all you'll need, is the ability to define some basic functions and the use of defined functions. That might actually be more than you need to write your own business rules engine. Okay? Um, and so you don't need to use XML for your business rules engines anymore. Well, hooray. Um, you could write a game with it as well. So um, what all the cool kids are doing now, though, is they're writing um, to JavaScript compilers. So shall we write one of those? So we're going to write the world's first logo to JavaScript compiler now. Just because we can. Atwood's law, anything that can be done in JavaScript will be done in JavaScript. So, I want to have something a little bit more advanced here. So I'm going to do some operators, and I want to draw a fractal tree with Logo. So I'm really kind of taking Logo up a gear, right? So we're going to have a more, more powerful parser, and I'll show you a little bit of that. And um, this is a recursive function that draws um, trees, right? So we're going to have this beautiful tree, and we're going to make it really draw really slowly by doing it in JavaScript. Um, so... It's kind of rewinding a little bit. What we, what we did to get our language up and running quickly, we defined an abstract syntax tree and a few lines of code. We wrote a simple interpreter first. Instead of going straight to compilation, we wrote a little interpreter. And we proved that we we're heading in the right direction. Because the worst thing you want to do is, or the last thing you want to do is, write it all out, do the entire parser in Java and the compiler bit, and then realize that you got something wrong and have to rewrite it again from scratch. You just want to do it in small bits 
and prove as we go. At least if we want to do it quickly. If we pay by the hour, <laughs> go with Java. So, um, what, we want to, what we want to do here for the JavaScript version is, um, instead of going leaping straight in and doing it, what I'm going to do is write what I think the JavaScript should look like in order, you know, the ideal JavaScript for this example I've got. And then I'll make my code compile into that JavaScript. So what I actually need is some form of um, mini library to draw in JavaScript. So I'm going to use the HTML5 canvas um, and some functions around that. So I'm just creating a canvas. We'll get, I'll get me a uh, canvas, forward, a little bit of math in JavaScript. Um, backwards. Um, so actually, for the trees, I need to go forwards and then come back again. All right. I need to turn, which should be left or right. So, and set random position, obviously, for artistic reasons. Um, so this is, the, this is the logo code I want to get to. So what I did is I sat down and go, well, what would that look like in JavaScript? And this is what it looks like, ideally, in JavaScript. We'd say, we, we, when the depth hits zero, we return. So that's the end of the recursion. Uh, we forward length, right angle, and then this is the recursion. So basically, I worked out how I want the JavaScript to go. Then, this is the funny thing about writing to JavaScript compilers. Basically, all I do is I copy and paste this into the, the, um, what was the interpreter and do a string format. Right? And string format writes out JavaScript code. Now, you can use that same technique for compiling to, say, C or Java code. Right? And a lot of compilers do that at the back end. They'll just compile out to C text files, and then off you go. Now, um, Erlang does that. That compiles down to a smaller text file language from Erlang. So everybody's doing it. We will, we will do a compile to machine code in a sec, just to, because that's uh, more enterprise and hardcore. So I've ramped up the um, abstract syntax tree a little bit more now. So now we're looking like an abstract syntax tree for pretty much every imperative language, you know, your C-sharp, your Java, your C's. So we need to have expressions. We need to have things like arithmetic, comparisons, and logical operations. So this is not very far away from C-sharp and Java now. Um, and our expressions will be, we could have numbers, strings. Um, so I'm pretty much at the JavaScript level of types now. <laughs> Um, arguments, variables, and then here's our arithmetic. So our expression could be, up for add, it would be the expression, the operation, and then the other expression, so like 1 plus 1. But because these are recursive, we can have 1 plus 1 as one expression, plus or times 3. So we can have any level of complexity, right? So it's in the expressions, in these maths expressions, where things get quite deep. The um, statement side, it's just one statement followed by another statement. So that's where um, these uh, union types that we've, we've described make it really easy and easy to reason about our abstract syntax tree. So our commands are pretty familiar. I've added a pen color. Um, I've also, so we've, we've brought over call and proc make is the same as var, right? So we're just defining a variable, okay? Uh, and then we've added if conditions. So we're pretty much able to do anything we want now. Uh, stop terminates, so that's the return statement. Cool. So, um, what I did was I, I used a parser that I'd already written and um, just copied it out of there into here, so I don't have to keep running the parser step, because I, I know the parser works. So that's just a cheesy, quick way of getting things running quickly, and I'm all about that. So, it's just one big string format. If we've got forward, 
then we write out the forward stream uh, with the value. Now, because it's an emit expression, what that could be is that would call, that could go inside itself and write out a long, another long expression, which would be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 times 7, right? Because it's going recursively back to emit the expression. Okay, so the emit expression is just down uh, here. So um, if it's a number, we just emit the number, string, quoted string, and so on. And uh, here we, we emit the arithmetic operator would be um, left side recursively the, uh, the, op the operator on the right hand side. And because um, I didn't want to have to write them all out, I just kind of, when it gets the arithmetic operator, it just gets those and drops them in. That's all there is to it. Um, let's see some more of those. An if condition, again, I kind of copied and pasted it from my ideal version. So we say if the expression, uh, then we do, um, we add in the block. Okay? And then I drop some uh, tabs as well. Stops a return. So it's just a piece of cake. And because we've defined it as a union type and we've got pattern matching, instead of having to do switch case and all these weird things, we just basically say, when I see one of those blocks, do this, format the string. It collects up the strings, and uh, bang, there we go. So, what I'm going to do is I'll just show you that. Basically, we've taken the... Um, the logo code, and we've turned it into JavaScript. To JavaScript compiler. It's pretty close to the ideal set that I originally drew. The only difference is for the ifs, I've arbitrarily put curly braces around everything, just to be sure, because I could have multiple statements inside that, that nested ifs, and I could have a special case go if there's only one, but I can't be, I can't be bothered. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, pretty much that's all go. So if we, um, if we were to take the code that we just generated and press run it, get past security, and uh, this is going to run in JavaScript. So that's taken that logo code, passed it, converted it to JavaScript and executed it in the browser. And all within like I don't know, tens of lines of code, and so you can pass out to Java or C, the same mechanism. That's tremendous. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> tremendous. Yes, good. Okay, so um, I think actually I'm going to do one more sample before we hit um, the break. Um, so what we've done so far is we've uh, gone out to JavaScript. Now the thing that people people get, you know, oh this must be really hard is getting out to IL or machine code, right? It's not that hard, but it is a little bit hard. So we're going to do that now. So pretty much the same technique we did with the JavaScript, and C sharp looks almost the same as JavaScript, so let's copy it and put it in there. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, so I need a library for the IL code to call, right? So I need some basic stuff. Um, I need to be able to uh, go forward. So pretty much like the JavaScript, I'm just writing a small library for the built-in functions. Uh, and then there's turn and so forth. Okay. Um, and actually, I can try that out from F sharp. So where am I? Why are you writing that in C sharp instead of F sharp? Um, because I copied it from the JavaScript. <laughs> but, I mean, realistically, c sharps are a fantastic imperative language. Um, probably a better imperative language. One of the best imperative languages around. So, and all I want to do is write a few functions. So I was fine for that. I think we use the right tool for the job. Passing, definitely uh, something that has pattern matching and, and union types. Uh, imperative for loops. Anything's good. Um, 
but I can actually test that from F Sharp. So I've actually built a DLL and I can call it from F Sharp without even compiling it. Um, so here's our circle. So that's kind of cool. So I get very quick feedback on that. Right. I'm going to do a smaller one because um, the code we had for the JavaScript was just like string formatting, right? So that was really easy. For the IL code, most imperative code, most languages like C Sharp and Java, have a pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping with machine code. So C was based, C was like a cross-platform um, assembler, right? So the core language statement parts, adding all that multiplying, calling things, that's the same as assembler. And it's, it's a statement-based language. It is pretty much one-to-one. -one. Um, and then there's a just, yeah, sometimes there's a few bits extra over that. We'll have a look at that. Yeah, it's kind of fun that we're all, majority of people still programming in assembler. So we've got the same old parser. Now, here's the bit that's going to convert it into... Um, into IL, .NET IL code. So uh, if it's a forward, we're going to emit an invoke instruction, which I'll show you in a bit. So all of these just resolve to invocations against the library. So that's a bit like a string format. And then we'll go and have a look at the hairy bit in a minute. So for the, um, for the invoke, what we do is we emit each argument that we need to call with. Right, so that's that for loop for all the args, emit. Now LDCI4 is load an integer. Okay. With the argument. We get the type of the library, get the method of the name that we were given, and emit a call to that method. So basically in, in Java and IL, what you're doing is you're basically putting all of the parameters one by one onto the stack and then you call a function. Right, and that's how assembler pretty much works, unless you're using registers. Right, so one-to-one -one with IL, IL's one-to-one -one with assembler, C is assembler. Fantastic. Now here's the hairy bit. Now there are things, so calling things pretty much as is, what we need to do for our repeat is we need to, if we were doing a for loop, we would have it is actually closer than our logo code. We'd have to define a variable i, and we'd start at zero, and we check it's less than a number, and then we'd add one. So if I was doing it from a for loop, you would look, almost look the same. Again, it would be the same as the assembler code, but because we're doing a high-level language here, logo, we, we're going to have to do, emit more code than we write. So uh, we're going to declare a local variable, which is an integer, and we're going to load in the count, and store it, so this is a store instruction into that local variable, that's fairly easy. Um, we're going to mark a label, we're going to do a go to, right? We're going to do basically a while loop. We'll emit all of the commands in the block here, and then what we'll do is we'll write out the repeat count, so we'll load back our local, subtract one, okay? So we're going to decrement it. Compare it with zero, so this is basically like a for loop, and then um, if it's greater than zero, we go back to our label. That's pretty hardcore, right? But not that hardcore. How do you actually, how do you make this easy? I didn't do that. All I did was write some C code, C sharp code. All right? I went to IL DASM. I copied the IL code, and I shoved it here. Then I went, that's probably that parameter, that parameter, and that parameter. And about five seconds later, I had the for loop. And for good measure, I put some comments in because I knew I was going to show it on this slide, on, uh, on, the, on the thing here. But it's actually not that hard. So all of the instructions you're going to probably have in your language have already been done. And you just go and write them, have a look what gets right, written out, and push it over. So that was easy. And literally, that's it. So this is for the very small thing that we, the very small subset of turtle we saw at the beginning. Um, now here's another piece of code that basically 
There's a load of boilerplate for generating .NET assembly. So I have to generate an assembly. I have to put inside that assembly a module, which is that bit there. Then I have to put in a type, right? Because you can't just have a function. I have to have a type called program. This is our public static void main nastiness. Um, and I define our static public main method here. I define that as the entry parameter. I emit all the instructions followed by a return statement. So for our simple logo, all we're going to do is just blast out the commands and put a return statement at the end. That's it. Job, job's done. So it's a nice, quick proof concept. Save out the uh, DLL. So I actually stole this code off the internet. Um, I've, written, I've got this in a number of projects. I've got quite a few things that don't do parsing so much, but they do generating code. Um, so I've got a behavior-driven development library, automated acceptance testing, which allows you to put breakpoints in the text file, in the given when then file. And it does that by taking the given when then, passing over it trivially, and then emitting IL code like this. And because I emit the IL code with a link back to the source text, you can sit the breakpoint in there. And you actually see the arguments as well inside the, the things that get called. So that's pretty cool. And that was something I knocked up in a couple of hundred lines of code. Um, so that's one example. I've got another example, which is a mocking library. Um, sorry if you've heard this joke before. Um, but I have a mocking library for F Sharp, which is based on a library called mock U, or mock, M-O-Q, in C Sharp land. Now, I wanted something that supported um, all the features of F Sharp. You can think of C Sharp as like a subset of F sharp, there's a lot of features that are not, aren't there. So I needed something more than mock U. And I went on Twitter and I said, what shall I call my F sharp mocking library? <laughs> so it's called Fock U. Um, it generates uh, IL code. And uh, I'm working on version two, which is Fock U2. Um, anyway, so, um, but what that does is it's just like looking over the definitions that you do in the mocking part and then just generating IL code like that. So it may be that you ha your code generation part doesn't necessarily have to be for a language. It could just be you want to get, you've got some, some sort of graph of, of code or data and you want to generate some sort of fast computation. Instead of interpreting it, you could, gen you could use this technique to generate the code or you just need it to run in code so you can get the debugger working. So um, that's that. Anyway, the grand finale before we have a break is I run all that code I've just shown you. That has generated a .NET assembly, saved it to disk, and printed it. You can copy that, give it to a friend. Actually, the JavaScript's cooler because you can just put it on your web page. But you can actually, that is a full on compiler. Cool. So what we'll do after the break is we'll move on to fully fledged what people kind of uh, compilers for languages that they do in their day job. Cool. Okay. Um, shall I get going again? Are we good? For... We're right. Spot on. Excellent. So that was our AST. Remember, it's so easy. Um, just before I go back into code, on, I'll uh, show you some more slides. So I, I did a um, how to write your own um, turtle language in an hour uh, course at the F-sharp user group in London and um, they, everybody wrote one and one of the guys took it, Stephen took it back to his five and seven year old and they were using the language he created in an hour and having loads of fun for days after drawing patterns with logo. Cool. And uh, I think it was, uh, they were asking him to extend the language so they could do different things. So also good. Um, so yeah, good story. Um, the uh, F-Sharp user group we have in London, we have, we have these hands-on sessions, usually once a month, where we do something crazy uh, like that. We've got about 800 and, 860 members for the F-Sharp user group in London. It's a reasonable number. Um, we, we meet every two weeks, so if you fancy coming down and having a laugh with us, have a night out in London, please do that. Um, cool, so that, that's the small side. What we're going to move on to next is the small basic uh, language that I talked about before. So 
my goal here is to um, make a, a version of Small Basic, a language released by Microsoft, used by hundreds of thousands of children and in education, and make a faithful version that can basically take any Small Basic program and run it, like this one maybe. So, now we're going to go hardcore. A little bit hardcore. So, oh, I have to press the Windows P button. Now, remember we finished with the JavaScript version, we had add operations and so forth. Our small basic language is basically the same as Logo. We have the standard set of operations. Um, Small Basic is a little bit more advanced than um, JavaScript because it has integers. Okay, um, we've got our standard operators. <laughs> but literally, this is the irony, you know, you, people are using JavaScript, and, you know, that's the value type set of, if we remove this one, that's the value type set of JavaScript. These things aren't that hard if you don't make them hard. Um, so our expressions, we can have literals, uh, var variables, we can get um, an array item, get at, call a function, which will return a value, negate, negate is different from the other arithmetic operations because you know, it's, it's a, a prefix operator. We have our standard arithmetic comparison of logical operators, which is what we had in Logo. Skip over those. Uh, we have 14 instructions in total in Small Basic by default. Um, so we can assign a value, x equals 10 or whatever. Um, set um, uh, array value, call an action, for loops, ifs, whiles. And there's just this weird obsession with Microsoft. You're trying to make the smallest possible language uh, you remove things, but you leave go to, you introduce go to that wasn't in Java, and you have the smallest subset you can in the language, and you still put go to in. I like go to, it's nice, it reminds me of the 70s. It does, I like it. Makes me, you know, like a bit of 70s music, like a bit of 70s coding. So, that's our AST. Um, what I've done is I've written an interpreter again, initially. So again, what I want to do is I don't want to spend a lot of time and get my abstract syntax tree wrong and then write a compiler and then realize I've got to rewrite it again. So what I want to do is get a quick feedback um, that I'm going in the right way. So I'm not even going to try the parser yet. I'm just going to uh, see if I can interpret the language. Um, so for evaluating an expression, if it's a literal, I just return the value. Right, in the interpreter. Variable, we go and get the variable from our list of identifiers, uh, and so on. So writing the interpreter, very similar to the logo one, took a few, you know, half an hour or something, and I've got my interpreter for small basic. And um, that's, that, that's basically the size of it. And then I started trying to just write, you know, I wrote the square bracket repeat 10 in brackets before, that was starting to go awry after a few lines. So I was, what I'll do is I'll write an internal DSL for small basic within F sharp. Right, so I can write my statements easily. Now, this is a good kind of side movement point. Most of the time, if you've got a decent functional programming language or a decent language, you can express the language you want to do as an internal DSL, as a language within your language, right? Now with F-sharp, you don't need to add brackets and semicolons to do parameters, right? You can make it look like business code. So most of the time, you probably start with an internal DSL. And only if you need something funky, uh, you would go to the parser step. But start with, a, start with the interpreter and the internal DSL, 
and then go from there. Don't rush straight into the compiler point if you're using a language that's, uh, that can express itself well. So, basic's a bit odd, but um, this is my internal DSL, so I say I'm going to assign, uh, for modulus, I assign the dividend to the result, while result is greater than or equal to divisor, subtract the divisor, right? So, as modulus written out in an imperative style. It's pretty close to the basic code, right? So, um, that's FizzBuzz. It's pretty long in small basic because the small basic is not particularly expressive at all. But we'll, we'll see what happens when we finish with it. So if I um, execute that, so that's generated the AST from the um, internal DSL. There's FizzBuzz. So I've written internal DSL for basic very quickly, um, an interpreter for, for small basic and the abstract syntax tree. I'm happy now, it's gonna work, right? The abstract syntax tree is good. I can do the parser for the abstract syn to the abstract syntax tree and use my interpreter and check it, double check again. And then once I'm happy with that, the parser, I'll then move on to the compilation step, which is the bit I don't wanna to have to change the compilation step because I've realized I've I've made it hard to pass into, or it just doesn't work for passing into. So that's my steps. And they're almost identical steps that I use for the trivial language. And this is what allowed me to write this in within 24 hours of lapse time. So, next part is the parser. So we've got the abstract syntax tree that we saw before. And we're gonna use fparsec. The numeric literal is almost the same as, um, sorry, that, I showed you an identifier right before. Numeric literals, um, it could be an integer or a float, so we just check, because it's not JavaScript, they're not numbers, it could be one or the other. Let's show you a few more bits and bobs. Uh, string literals are between quotes. find you a nice one. Our operators, I haven't shown you this before, uh, F, the parser combinator library has a operator uh, parser built in that you just parameterize. So I just copied and pasted this off the website and adjusted the priority. Um, these are the priorities of, so plus might have higher priority than multiply or the other way around, or they might all have the same priority. You need to define that if you want to be keep it the same as the language that you're trying to target. Um, so that was that done. That's usually the hardest part of writing a parser is dealing with the plus, minus, multiply, the expression part, because it's recursive and you could have brackets. And try and do that manually is a real pain. <laughs> I've done it. I mean, this would be like maybe 50 or 100 lines of F-sharp to do the same thing. Um, but here I just get a nice, easy way. So that's good. And there's the other operators, and and all. Let's try and find a nice cute thing. For loops. We did uh, repeat blocks before. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just building up small functions. So when I'm trying it out in the interactive window, I'll just do the first bit, which is a four with a set, so a set would be i equals zero, but it could be i equals the return of another function, yeah? Um, so a four followed by a p set, so I've already defined p set. Two has an arithmetic um, block, so that, that's just a number. Um, and steps the same. And then what we say is um, from two, and an optional step, right? Because step may or may not be there. And um, if there's no step, then I'll just make the step one. Yeah, that's, and that's the for loop. And then end for, and end, end for is just that. So basically, again, we're just taking each of these instructions, breaking them down to small bits. So here I've dropped the 
four loop into small blocks and then just compose them together. So pipe three just says pipe three different bits together, push them together. It's pretty easy. Uh, while loop's even easier, logical statement, while, logical statement, goes there, and while, out, uh, if, um, takes a logical statement followed by a then, and so on. All good, right? So it's just getting through them all, really, and you just write them all little by little. And then when we're finished, we've got them all together, we just say the instructions could be any of those ones, right? Those are our, our instruction set. Um, so what I'm doing here is a little bit, because I'm moving up to the stage of actually having a full-on programming language. It's the, these are the instruction list. It will attempt all of them. Now what it's going to do when it's attempting them is if it can't get it, it will move the cursor back to where it started the attempt from. Right? And then it will choose the one that it, it wanted. The, the one that matched. Or it will give us one of those wondrous error messages saying I couldn't find an instruction that I was looking for. Okay. So That's the interpreter again, we'll skip over that. So where I defined an internal DSL before, this is the um, FizzBuzz defined in small basic code. So what we'll do, we'll use that pass that we generated and then we'll run it. I'll, uh, I'll do it in two stages. Oops. Okay, so that's passed that code into the AST, just like we did with Logo. And then I can run that through the interpreter. Fizzbuzz. So, we've got a parser and an interpreter. Compiler. So, the, the main point here is, I mean, I'm, I'm skipping over bits, but you can probably see that this is very much like the really trivial turtle programming language that we did before, with just with lots more instructions on it. Um, so it's not really that hard. So um, for the um, emitting of IL code, very much like before. So we're going to emit literals. So if it's a boolean uh, in .NET, a boolean is one, and we'll emit that primitive, and so on. Uh, let's see if we can find something interesting. Uh, expressions, so the um, stuff that we saw before. Um, so I'm just omitting the. Um, I actually, small basic is a dynamic language, so I, instead of omitting add, I'm omitting a uh, call to add, which will um, basically do crazy things like JavaScript, like if it's a number and a string, it will create an, a, a number, but if it's a string and a number, it will create a string. You know, that, that stuff that people really love. Um, because I need to be faithful <laughs> to the original language. So, same sort of thing. The call goes out to uh, emit call. Um, let's see if we can find some fun stuff. But again, I just literally just put this stuff in to C sharp and then pulled out um, what I wanted to do. Um, so 